So our hormonal responses to resistance training, I think this slide sums it up quite nicely because if you look at the barbell over on the right, there are certain mechanical forces that, that are imposed upon the muscle and our exercise stimulus such as the volume, the sets times the reps, also the intensity and our rest periods, they will dictate the glands of the, what, was resp or what is secreted from the glands of the endocrine system. So that's the classic endocrine response that goes through the bloodstream, things like growth hormone and tes tes testosterone, and they bind onto the receptors on the cell, as we can see the large cell over on the left, and they get inside, the steroid hormones get inside and influence our DNA and, and change the response of the cell. So this can happen inside muscle cells and, and, and other cells to determine cell breakdown or cell growth. But there are also other uh, more indirect and, and less known effects of the endocrine system. So we have parocrine um, hormone release, which you can see down at the bottom in the, the blue flattened disc. And that's when a hormone is released inside of a cell, so not the endocrine system classically. It's released inside of a cell and it goes into the bloodstream and has an effect on other cells or target tissues in the body. And then lastly, we have autocrine release, and that is when the mechanical forces imposed on a muscle um, it trigger a, a release of, of certain hormones um, inside of the cell to take an effect actually inside the same cell. So we can see there are, are different effects from, on different ways that, that resistance training or other forms of training can actually affect the cells of our body. And remember that a lot of it is about the number and, and the quality of receptors that are around. It's not just about the amount of hormone that's in the bloodstream. It actually has to get inside the cell to have an effect. Welcome to the movement recovery section. In this lecture, we're really going to discuss what's a vitally important and crucial component of everybody's training, and often are the most underlooked, or rather the most overlooked. Um, Movement recovery is more than just talking about how you recover from a single movement or a single session or a single stress. It's really this huge umbrella of how do we promote recovery following the stress of movement. And what we know is that training plus recovery equals positive adaptation. The question is, all exercise, all training is a stress. It doesn't matter what you term it, whether it's resistance training, cardio training, or energy system development, whether it's speed, agility, quickness, games, recreation, sport, movement can be a stress. So if we're already stressing, if we're stressing an already stressed system, it just equals more stress. And in earlier modules, we've covered topics like periodization, we've covered topics like the physiology of exercise. And as we can clearly see that the biological systems of the body do get fatigued following an exercise stress, and they supercompensate and they bounce back. And in that phase of supercompensation, we have a brief window of opportunity to really adapt and positively grow. And if we don't take the opportunity, involution occurs and we bounce back to homeostasis. So the whole point of this lecture now is to cover movement recovery. What tools, what techniques, and how can we safely and simply use them to promote recovery? There are many, many strategies to promote recovery and there are many, many ways that we can do this. We can do this within a single unit, i.e. within a single session. We can do this within a cycle, uh, a micro cycle, a week of training. We can do it within a meso cycle, a, a month or six weeks of training. Um, and so what we want to do now is go through sequentially how we cover each of those. There are many tools and many strategies to enhance recovery and regeneration. Doug, the power of functional nomenclature is that we can take an exercise and we can effectively manipulate it for a purpose. And again, there's multiple purposes. Uh, we want our patients and clients to be successful and to gradually be more and more successful, as you said, to allow them to feel the encouragement of, that success brings. But also many times we might want to say, gee, I want them to actually feel better. They may have a little pain or discomfort with a certain exercise. And instead of bailing out, if we have the power of the functional nomenclature, we can manipulate that exercise in order to allow them to be successful at it, not only be successful at the movement, but have less pain and discomfort. How do we start putting that in our minds? How do we grab that? Because there's so many things that we can choose from. It's a great question. When you talk about exercise, it's just that of how to manipulate that exercise to better serve the person that's in front of us. 
whether he or she wants to be better at X, Y, or Z. That's what we have to keep in mind, but also take a step back and watch the exercise take place and think to ourselves, how in the world can I make this better for this person today? The two arm dumbbell uppercut with diagonal step is um, primarily for the front lines of the body. So to perform this exercise we take a diagonal step and at the same time, and this is crucial, the same time as we're stepping we perform the dumbbell curl. This exercise is much much easier if you step first and then do the curl but it doesn't um, really perform what we want to do. If you'll notice here, the dumbbells are never staying still, so there's constant loading to unloading, and there's a lot of control required through the core, because as he throws the arms up when he's on an unstable platform, i.e. in one leg, because he's stepping at the same time, a lot of, of core strength and coordination and timing is required.